Hi, I'm Robert Flange and welcome to Science Kitchen. Science Kitchen. Is your food bland and awful? Is your garden rabbit with slimy gyms and shelly bellies? Well, say hello to new table salt. Table salt. It can do anything. Look at all this wonderful food. Chips, mashed potatoes, chips and ham, peas, peas and mince, chips and mince, slugs on toast, skunk on a cob, turkey drum drums, and toad in a hole. And it's so easy to make. Just two simple ingredients. Sodium and chlorine gas. Just mix them together and watch the reaction go. There's a window that's open and that's obviously fueling the fires more. Table salt. It's chuffing brilliant. Sodium is the second of the alkaline metals, and similar to its brothers and sisters, it's a silvery, highly reactive solid in its pure form. If you drop a pellet of sodium metal in water, it will give off a brilliant yellow flame, producing sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. In fact, the flame from this reaction is the same shade of yellow you can see in most street lamps, which generate visible light from vaporised sodium plasma. Same principle as neon lamps now I think of it. If only there was a video by a strapping young chemist that explains such technology in more detail. <coughs> Unconvincing. <coughs> the most common sodium compound on Earth is a white crystalline substance known to chemists as sodium chloride, and as salt, to people who aren't totally cool. In chemistry, the word salt just means any compound made of positive and negative ions arranged in a lattice. It's a word used to describe literally thousands of compounds in the chemical literature, including, funnily enough, sodium chloride, which is made out of a one-to-one -one ratio of positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chloride ions. Salt has been used to season food for millennia, but the chefs among you will know it comes in many different shapes and sizes. Many chefs prefer to cook with kosher salt, a coarse, flat-grain salt used in traditional Jewish cooking to remove blood from meat after it's been butchered. Flakes of kosher salt tend to be larger and less dense than table salt, so it will salt food in a gentler, more controllable way. Sort of like the difference between applying makeup with a brush versus slathering it on with a B&Q paint roller. Most brands of kosher salt also have fewer additives than table salt. Before sending salt to the shops, manufacturers will usually add small amounts of anti-caking agents like dextran sulfate to stop the grains from clumping together. In addition, they will also add small amounts of iodine salts like sodium iodide. Iodine salts are essential minerals, particularly for children who need them to help their thyroid glands develop properly. But in salt, they can lend a slight metallic taste to food. So the salt that your chemistry teacher brought in from Tesco's probably isn't just sodium sodium chloride. Just 99% sodium chloride, actually. Nice fact to know if you want to look clever, or if you're trying to lose friends as efficiently as possible. Nowadays, salt is readily available in all good chip shops, but in ancient times it was a pretty valuable commodity. Salt's always been fairly easy to find, you just filtered it from the ocean or salt water springs, depending how close your town was to the coast but harvesting it in sellable quantities was an arduous, time-consuming process. In history class, you may have heard the Romans valued salt so highly they used it to pay their legionnaires. Well, sucks to be you if that's the case, because turns out it's completely incorrect. The salt salary myth came from a popular theory in linguistics that the English word salary was derived from the Latin word salarium, which literally translates to salt. The word for regular wage comes from salt, therefore Romans paid in salt. Pretty easy. But classicists have since analysed this line of reasoning more thoroughly, and the Roman salt wage theory has proven to be pretty historically baseless. Salt was certainly an important part of the Roman economy, but it was nowhere near valuable enough to make up for a day's wage, and there's no evidence to suggest it was ever used as a common form of currency. If current opinion is anything to go by, Roman legionnaires were probably paid in regular old coins. A massive anticlimax in my opinion, but I'm not sure what I was expecting. Right then, Spurious Augustinus, good work defending the Empire. Here's three book vouchers, two packets of crisps, and a handful of lolly sticks I found in a bin. Sodium, as well as about 17 million other elements, was first prepared by none other than Sir Humphrey Davy. Chemist, slash inventor, slash poet, slash all around clever little bunny. Davy was born and raised in Penzance, Cornwall, which makes him Cornish, not English. Thank you very much, Encyclopedia Britannica. No need to snub the Cornish nationalists so hard, frankly. I'm sure both of them are very upset. Davy was one of the pioneers of electrochemistry, the study of chemical reactions that use or produce electrical current. The first modern battery was invented by the Italian physicist Alessandro Volta in 1799, known then as the voltaic pile. If you want to make your own voltaic pile blue pieces style, all you need are three three things, a sheet of copper, a sheet of zinc, and some cloth or cardboard that's been soaked in salt water. Cut the copper and zinc into little squares, then stack them one on top of the other, making sure to separate them with a salty cloth. Attach some wires at both ends, and hey presto, you've made yourself a reasonably reliable source of electricity, albeit a slightly crusty one. Now the voltaic pile was a nice little toy for getting frog's legs to twitch, but Davy was one of the first experimentalists that realised its potential as a tool in the chemistry lab. With an electrical current to play around with, chemists could split ionic compounds like salts into their composite ions. Positive ions would gather at the next negative terminal, in this case zinc, and negative ions would gather at the positive terminal, in this case copper, a process now known as electrolysis, which literally means breaking down with electricity. Sodium was the second element discovered by Davy, and was first prepared by passing an electrical current through a molten solution of sodium hydroxide, a variant of the setup he had used to isolate potassium the year prior. Over the next year of his life, Davy would use 
electrolysis to discover boron and basically all of the group 2 metals, presumably just as a flex. Now, those of you with a keen eye and a passing familiarity with your ABCs may have noticed sodium's rather unusual chemical symbol, a symbol which ironically doesn't contain a single letter from the word sodium. Na is an abbreviation of the Latin word natrium, which is a reference to natron, a flaky sodium salt used by the ancient Egyptians to preserve mummies. But that raises an interesting question. Why do we put up with the abbreviation these days? Why haven't scientists changed sodium symbol to something more fitting, like SO or SD? Point one. At time of recording, there are 118 elements on the periodic table, all of which have to have unique one to two letter symbols for chemical nomenclature to make any sense. Assigning alphabetically pleasing symbols to every element without repetitions and persuading other scientists to use these symbols instead of the old ones would be, in technical terms, a bit of a mare, and would take precious time that scientists could be using to do more interesting things, like conducting experiments or going to Disneyland. Point two. Even if we rejigged every symbol on the table to align with the element's name in English, it'd be a bit of a raw deal for chemists in different countries. NA is a pretty unusual symbol in English, but it makes a lot more sense to chemists from Estonia and Germany, who call sodium natrium and natrium respectively. Similar translations exist for a handful of other European languages. Well, I say handful. Over half the official languages of the European Union, more like. But you know, principle matters. Brexit means Brexit and all that. Can't have Johnny Foreigner getting too big for his boots with his funny words and his wonderful chocolate and his big, strong hands. Sorry, that got weird on me. And point three. Well, most chemists like the table as it is. I do, and I spend about 85% of my free time writing nonsense about it like a chimp scratching its arse with an ergonomic keyboard. The periodic table is a living, breathing piece of history. It's been stitched together, square by square, by generation after generation of scientists, like a checkered, radioactive family quilt. Each unusual and wonky symbol is a love letter to the chemical pioneers of the past. And frankly, why erase all their history for the sake of neatening up a spreadsheet or two? So that's sodium then. It's dawned on me that I accidentally snubbed Davy by a mission in the Boron episode, but be fair, and that video was long enough as it was. If you like the video, make sure to subscribe and stick around. And if you thought it was terrible, subscribe anyway, because I guarantee you it's only going to get more fascinatingly awful the further you go. Sort of like being given a tour of the family home by Joseph Fritzl.